Born Gertrude Van Fossen in 1929, Banishevsky was raised in Indiana together with five siblings. Gertrude was reportedly cold with and detached from her mother, but was extremely close to her father, who died of a heart attack when Gertrude was just 11 years old. Eventually, Gertrude met and married a John Banachevsky, an Indiana police officer. Theirs was not a happy marriage. John had a bad temper and beat Gertrude on occasion. Still, they had four children together and managed to hold the marriage together for 10 years. Gertrude divorced John and kept custody of their children. She married another man, but that marriage lasted only months. Eventually, John remarried Gertrude and they lasted another seven years and had two more children. John and Gertrude divorced a final time in 1963. Banishevsky went on to have an affair with a man named Dennis Wright and had one son with him who was named Dennis Jr. Dennis Wright Sr. abandoned Gertrude and his son. She was suddenly left to fend for herself and seven children. She was forced to earn money by doing odd jobs and babysitting local children. She was receiving intermittent child support from John, but it was not a reliable source of income. At the time, her 17-year-old daughter Paula had become pregnant with a married man's child, mounting pressure on Gertrude. In 1965, Paula Banaszewski met a 16-year-old girl named Sylvia Likens and her 15-year-old sister Jenny. Jenny was somewhat disabled, having been struck down by polio, which left her requiring leg braces to walk. Sylvia and Jenny's parents were carnival workers and, at the time, their mother Betty had split from her husband Lester and taken the girls with her. She was arrested for shoplifting, and it was then that Paula Banaszewski met the Likens sisters. She brought them home with her to spend the night. Lester Likens appeared the next day and struck up a deal with Gertrude. He and Betty Likens decided to get back together and travel with the carnival as carnies. He agreed to board Sylvia and Jenny with Gertrude for the summer for $20 a week. When the first payment failed to arrive, it triggered something in Gertrude. She blamed the two young girls and forced them to drop their pants and bend over a bed while she beat their buttocks. This was only the beginning of a long and painful torture for Sylvia. Fortunately, her sister Jenny was largely spared, perhaps due to some small measure of pity from Gertrude, given Jenny's poor health. Gertrude thought of all manner of ways to abuse Sylvia over the next three months. She once heard that Sylvia had eaten too much at a church social, so she forced her to eat a hot dog covered in condiments and spice. When Sylvia vomited, Gertrude forced her to scoop it up and eat it as well. When Gertrude learned that Sylvia had once been, in her own words, felt up, she attacked Sylvia and repeatedly kicked her in the groin, calling her a whore. Soon, Banachevsky had enlisted the help of her children and even neighboring children. Everyone delighted in thinking of new ways to torture poor Sylvia, while Jenny was left to observe, no doubt frightened for her life. Guests and those who lived at the home would use Sylvia's body to extinguish their cigarettes. Neighborhood boys, including 14-year-old Ricky Hobbs and 15-year-old Coy Hubbard, would beat Sylvia in the basement and use her for judo practice. She was repeatedly kicked and punched, flipped over shoulders, and smashed against the basement floor. She endured sexual assaults and mutilations. She was once held down while Gertrude used a hot needle to carve the words into Sylvia's stomach. I am a prostitute and proud of it. Sylvia was to endure broken teeth, black eyes, cuts, bruising, and burns over almost every inch of her body. She had a baby's feces and urine smeared into her mouth. She was starved and deprived of toilet privileges. She became malnourished and incontinent, so Gertrude kept her in the basement where Sylvia had no choice but to defecate and urinate on the floor. Banaszewski then took to the habit of bathing Sylvia in a bath filled with scalding water. Repeatedly, Sylvia was subjected to this, having her hands and feet bound as she was dunked into the hot water. Sometimes, the water had laundry detergent in it, further burning Sylvia's open sores. Coy Hubbard would assist Gertrude in her excessive torment of Sylvia. She was treated as a carnival exhibit. 
Kids would pay a nickel to see Sylvia thrown down the basement stairs or otherwise tortured. On the evening of October the 25th, Sylvia tried to run away, fearful for her life. Because she was so weak and malnourished, she didn't even come close to escaping. Once Gertrude gained the upper hand, she beat Sylvia in the face with a curtain rod until it broke in several places, followed up with a strike from Coy Hubbard that knocked her out. By the morning of October the 26th, Sylvia was close to death. She moved in jerking motions and was unable to speak properly. When she defecated, Gertrude ordered her to clean herself up. John Banaszewski Jr. thought it would be hilarious to spray down Sylvia with a water hose. When she attempted to flee from it, she collapsed by the basement stairs and Gertrude stomped on her head. Gertrude once again decided it was time for one of Sylvia's special baths. She had two of the children carry Sylvia to the bath and put her in. It was then that they all realized that Sylvia was dead. The life of a once vivacious and beautiful girl was ended by monsters who did it simply because they could.